So we support the Departments of Defense, Homeland Security, and Department of Justice, and we provide people. We are experts in everything from unmanned aerial systems, robotics, nuclear engineering, you name it, we, we deal with it. I don't have an expertise in all of those, but I do have an expertise in finding really great people who do have that expertise. And we marry up government needs with the capabilities of subject matter experts from all over the world. Hi everyone and welcome back to a new episode of the World Class Leader Show. In today's episode, I'm honored to have with me Lisa Rosenthal. And Lisa is the CEO and the co-founder of Maven. Through her focus on innovation and corporate culture and strategic leadership, Maven has achieved significant growth by penetrating new and emerging markets through diversified clients, supporting them primarily the departments of defense, homeland security, and justice. And prior to starting Maven, she provided analytic management and operations to support to DOD, DOE, and intelligence community, and et cetera, et cetera. Now she has the best and the brightest to serve national security interests at home and abroad. Lisa loves being part of the global community and proudly serves on the Florida Atlantic University Advisory Board, the Trust DC Advisory Board, University Entre Entrepreneurship Council, and more of that. And by the way, it's interesting that Lisa has an addition to 20 new unique skill certifications. So it sounds like you are all about learning, which I love that. And also, finally, in your free time, you also have a small angel fund. So Level Up Ventures with your business partner, Victor Pirovsky. Well, Lisa, great, great introduction. So thank you for being on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. Super excited to be here. Great. So Lisa, um. Tell us a little bit more, really in a, in a few minutes. You, you, you launched your consulting firm, your, your company that specializes in, as we said, in developing value, important things to, for, you know, to serve national security interest in the U.S. So what was the idea? What was, what was the thing that actually led you to create that? So tell us more about how that was, how it started essentially, maybe. I think an entrepreneur is an entrepreneur and you know it and you just have to figure out the right venue to become that entrepreneur and what is your calling with it. And, and I quickly discovered that supporting the U.S. government as well as now NATO and uh, NATO countries was my calling, finding different ways to support the global environment in terms of national security was absolutely what I was doing uh, and I had been working at the United States Army's Rapid Equipping Force, a fantastic organization that was dedicated to uh, protecting American soldiers. And from there, I met some really amazing, fantastic people. And one day I looked up at them and said, hey, guys, I think we should quit our jobs, go to a salary zero and start a company. All of them looked at me and said, you're out of your mind. We have no idea how to write proposals. None of us have ever been mid-level management. And, oh, at least we're um, broke. None of us have any money. Wow. Like, okay, okay. All right. You're right. This is a true story, but I think we can do it because we have honesty, integrity. We believe in a mission and we have Google. What can't you do without Google, right? If you've got Google, you've got everything. And so no kidding within six months, quit my job, went to a salary zero, started Maven with a concept written out on a napkin uh, to make it more fun, because who doesn't love a great story? I also divorced my husband within that same six months. So I went through a whole life crisis and emerged running one of the coolest companies ever. Well, I'm a little biased on that one, but yes. <laughs> well, first of all, the idea of the napkin is really much into, you know, all the bias that we have about being an entrepreneur, primarily from Silicon Valley. Yeah. So it sounds like perfect fit for, for that conversation. And and also, it sounds like you had that sort of, you know, when we have the, those moments, I call the breakthrough moments, when we have the idea that starts circulating in our mind and becomes a thing. And it sounds like you made some very direct and clear choices to run your life in a different way. And it sounds like it's, it's pay off. When was that, by the way, Lisa? Oh, I'm aging myself here. It was in 2008. <laughs> so Maven okay. just celebrated our 15th anniversary. Well, congratulations. So, which is incredible considering I'm only about 30 now. So so it started with a piece of paper, napkin. Mm -hmm. It started with Google. It started with uh, a lot of, you know, uncertainty about it. So mm -hmm. where is right now? Where are you right now with Maven? 
So in terms so of we, size, growth, so tell us a little bit more about your inspiring story. Yes, absolutely. We are now, Maven is just one business partner, Victor Porowski and myself. Uh, the entrepreneurship life cycle, lifestyle and cycle isn't for everyone. So him and I have now run Maven, which we will close our year at over $90 million this year. Wow. From zero, where we had zero loans. So we have zero debt, which is kind of exciting for us, but we never took one penny out, which is very unusual, I think. So we went from zero to 90 million in the last 15 years, really 11. And we have almost 500 people all over the world. And we just recently launched an international training division. Um, and nice. We were over in the Czech Republic just last week, working with any number of NATO and NATO adjacent countries. So is your idea of expanding internationally, that's the reason. So NATO, of course, is the, the probably the biggest and global you know, organization out there. But is that part of your vision for the future? So tell us a bit more about the future that you are envisioning for yourself or maybe because it sounds like given the drive that you have, the ambition that you have, I'm 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 sure that you're just scratching the surface here. So there is there is more to come. Is that a fair assumption? I don't think idle is ever an option and stagnancy right. will, will probably never exactly be a word to describe me or my business partner. Right. It's always what's next. How can we influence or impact the world security environment, especially with all the very scary things happening right yeah. now between Ukraine, yeah. uh, among Ukraine, what's going on in obviously Israel and what's happening with Indo-PACOM and, and all the emerging threats and the deterrence mission. How do you stay at the cutting edge to, to help keep the world safe and continue to, to support the ideals of democracy and yeah. the concepts of national security? Yeah, and, yeah, and, and you're right. So, you know, by the time that we are recording this episode, you know, so many bad things happening, especially in this area of the world where we are, where yes. I'm located, so Europe and in the Middle East. Um, look, it's interesting. It's the first time I interview someone that operates in your space. So the national security. So I'm look. I might be biased, but I'm sure there are things that you can share. You don't want to share because there's a part of your confidentiality agreement that you have. So, but just to to let the audience understand a bit, a little bit more about what does it mean serving for national security for Maven. What's the main things that you provide, your service, and I, and, I, and again, go where mm -hmm. you can so nobody is forcing to say anything you can. It's absolutely fine. So we support the Departments of Defense, Homeland Security, and Department of Justice, and we provide people. So we provide subject matter experts, and okay. the word maven, the name of the company is actually subject matter expert is what loosely it translates to. So okay. we provide very incredible, brilliant folks to each of these organizations within the Departments of Defense, Homeland Security, and Justice that help them run the operations. And we can help with everything from helping with budgets. We provide analysis, strategic advice. We are experts in everything from unmanned aerial systems, robotics, nuclear engineering. We have a very law enforcement uh, lethality c4 c5 isr which i'm sure everybody tracks every day right uh radio networks you name it we we deal with it so okay. customs and border protection with tunnels and how do you find them so that's the area and i don't have an expertise in all of those but i do have an expertise in finding really great people who do have that expertise and we marry up government needs with the capabilities of subject matter experts from all over the world in all sorts of disciplines. Great. So it's primarily resources and people, but it sounds like there is an element of some additional support that you provide in terms of advisory services. Yes, absolutely. We don't provide any technology. We yeah. are what we would call technology agnostic. Our job is to advise the government on what the appropriate solution will be for anything. We don't represent the government. We don't speak for the yeah. government. We yeah. only provide the advice or guidance. So what, we have the coolest clients around. We really, it's fascinating what they all do. Yeah. So how, what 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 do you find differently, you know, outside of the U.S., you know, you're in, in the national security in the U.S., than what you are now starting to see in Europe, uh, you know, with NATO? How do you see your approach different? Uh, or in other words, the, the same thing that you are 
you're doing and is being requested by the government in the US is the same thing that you see from NATO other organization or it sounds like they might drive maybe into different directions in terms of the future so just give an idea of what so the international component that we're focusing on is twofold one we do support global operations from the US perspective so on behalf of the government we will travel and we'll support any area in the world with what the government asks and we operate completely within the confines of what the government wants us to do. The other side is what we're doing directly with NATO governments is providing support to what their training needs are. Okay. So we're helping provide training and it's not necessarily always us that does the training, but we will marry up what their requirements are with what the capabilities are for US-based firms and sometimes with other NATO-based firms that provide a specialty in training. So if a military, a foreign military needs to be better trained on how to breach a building we will help them find the right place and we will help them learn better what we call tactics, techniques and procedures or maybe it's even the right technology to provide that service to teach them how to be the best they can possibly be at what it is. Interesting. So it sounds like it's a more technical training to some extent or Absolutely. is a part of the training also how to lead you know their people when they are on site or is a little bit more communication it sounds like it's more technical right that's my it's understanding far more technical i would yeah. say tactical training tactical tactical, tra tactical level training would be the appropriate term okay great you said something before i'm so now fascinated because so, okay that's <laughs> that's a question i want to ask you you said i'm so good or finding the right people what's the secret for you to find the right people because i'm sure that If you do that for your own clients, I'm sure that you're doing as well for building your company. The success of maybe, I think, is an indicator that you are surrounded by the right people. So what's your secret or principle to find the right people? Treat them well. I think you eventually get a reputation for right. how you treat people. Yeah. And for me, the goal is to become a magnet firm, to end up with the best and the brightest that we have. Um, Government rates aren't always super sexy, mm -hmm. but if you create the right culture and if you create the right environment for people to grow and advance, I do think that starts to create almost a cult-like environment where it gets catchy. We just recently had one of my favorite employees who decided to go off and try something new away from Maven. And just last week, she called and said, I want to come back. And I said, absolutely, come join our team again. And But we provide all the resources to to try and support their growth and development. For example, we provide annually for every single employee a $5,000 training budget. Nice. Well, that's not which, really common. Right. And so we just, a couple of weeks ago, opened with a student loan reimbursement plan. So if you have student loans, we're going to help pay those off, right? So trying to create it, the environment is important with, with the benefits, right? Everybody needs the basic benefits, but more than that, they need a tribe. And I'd like to think that Maven is creating a tribe for people where they have folks that they can rely on, where they know they can call up and say, hey, this is really upsetting to me, or, or oh my gosh, this just happened to my family. What do mm -hmm. I do? Mm -hmm. We provide that back because the people here in the corporate office, they actually care. They believe in what we're doing. They believe in the type of people we're supporting and the missions we're supporting. So mission and mission and purpose are essential. And how you treat people is, is a general rule is just treat them with dignity and respect. Yeah, fair. that goes a long way. It's people aren't transactional. They're not. They're a resource, right? But it's not if you do A, you get B. There's more to it. And sometimes there's gray. Yeah, well, it sounds like that is a cultural uh, mentality, specific cultural behaviors, habits that you created for you and for your organization. So everyone believes to the same principles. How difficult has been to maintain, to keep this, this, this cultural appreciation people, treating them well when you started to grow? Because normally, you know, when we are a few individuals in an organization, it's very easy to define the behaviors that you we want for ourselves, for the for the small you know, circle of people. But when you start to grow, like the incredible growth of your company, at some point, there is always a risk that you, the culture that you have in mind, it start gets diluted. So it's something that you actually consider, concern about, think about. Mm -hmm. 
every day, if there's anything that keeps me up at night is that. So we are a high growth firm and I want to continue because we want to give people the opportunity to move and grow their own career within the company without them having to take off and abandon me. Um, but there, I think there's three, not think, there is three components for us in continuing to, to maintain the culture we have as we expand outside of just the DC area. We're in 30 states now and we support every combatant command there is. So one is regular communication. Every single Thursday, I send out a five things you need to know for everybody to read. I try to reduce all the noise in, in communication and limit it to five things that people should know about what's happening in the firm. And it's interesting because every single week, a different group of people will respond back to me. And it's allowed me to get to know the company and what people are actually thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, I mentioned in one of my five things you need to know is, hey, reminder, October is National uh, Breast Cancer Awareness. And reminder, Maven will cover 3D mammograms for anybody in this farm plus their partners. And I sent this out as a reminder is my five things you need to know. And at least 10 women and men sent me a direct email telling me their personal story with the breast cancer and how important the mammograms were. And that creates that connection because something matters to somebody and I'm going to hit it at some point. Number one, that. Number two is I actually go and meet with everybody in the company or my management team does. Mm. For the month of December, I have 13 flights scheduled to hit 13 different holiday parties where I will hand out as much as possible individual bonuses for every single person in the company and try to shake their hand or hug them if I know them to say, hey, what's going on? What can we do better for you? And third is hire the right people. My management team is second to none in the industry. I've got guys, Tony and Will and Kurt and Slappy and, and just Pat and Victor, Jason, these people, Rick, these guys are amazing at what they do. And we all have the same ethos. We all have the same morality and we have the same belief system. Mm. And when you have that, the culture goes down at each level. Yeah. Totally. And it stays and they engage with them. Everybody in, in the entire marshal service on that contract knows the, the guy running it, Tony. He cares. That goes so far to actually just care and listen. And you think that resonates with people in your organization because the service that you provide also helps people in the field to feel connected, to feel engaged, to feel together. There is an element of that, or it's just a coincidence that you're operating in a market where, you know, people feel the need to be uh, taken care of, I would say, you know, because we have this idea of, you know, people that have such a critical role, you know, for national security, they might feel lonely at some point, they might feel that they, they, the sense of belonging is, in, is critical for them. It sounds like everything is well connected. It, I do think it's all interconnected and mission and purpose matter more yeah. than anything. And with a company like ours, where we provide people to various missions and they're on client sites, the people, the employees, even though they're Maven employees, they're really loyal to the mission of the client they're serving. So if we lose mm -hmm. a contract, I know 90% of them will go to the next contractor and then I'll just be replaced out. Mm -hmm. My intention though, is if we don't lose that contract, I want them to stay with me. So how do I get to those folks? I don't know what the right answers are. And I regularly ask the team, like, what do we need to do to keep you? What, what is it that needs to happen? Nice. So it, communication, it, ask them, what do you need? And I have found that everybody needs a tribe. Everybody needs a group of people they know they can rely on and ask questions to. I'm very frustrated with people who want to quiet quit or just walk away without a conversation. I don't know how to change that culture of, oh, look, the grass is greener over there. When in reality, the grass is greenest where you water it, yeah. right? It's not on the other side of the fence, but how do you get to those people? It's the constant struggle that we have as a leadership team and as entrepreneurs or as business, business executives. How do you get the right people? How do you make them stay? How do you keep them excited? If anybody has that magic sauce, I'd love to know. <laughs> no, I don't think there is there is that. It's not a magic bullet. So, but I think it sounds like you know the approach you you have. It sounds like it's really working a lot. You said one important thing. You said having the same values, uh, having mm -hmm. the same purpose, having the same attitude is been one of the major 
reason for success or having the right team around you. But what you're looking for, you know, you say you have an amazing management team. What you're looking for in people? Because look, you know, there are different, you know, school of thoughts. You know, someone say, well, you know, looking for skills, knowledge, etc. Someone else say, I'm looking for attitude. What is being, you know, your what is the main criteria for you to recruit leaders in your organization? There's only three. I believe there's only three things because I can teach skills. I can't teach integrity. Hmm. You either have integrity or you don't. Okay. The quickest way to get fired from Maven is to lie or show you lack integrity. Number two, you have to have a work ethic and a drive. If you're in it just to get in your however many hours and leave at that minute, it's not going to be effective because you work till you get the job done. Some days that's going to be five hours. Some days that's going to be worse. I don't want anybody working 60 hour weeks, but you have to have the drive and the pride of ownership of what you're doing. And the third is personality. I don't care how smart you are. If I'm getting stuck in an airport, you better have a decent personality because I've been in a lot of airports with people <laughs> and eight hours later, I'm still sitting there with them. And I want to jump off the plane. Like I'm going to jump off of this plane if I'm with this person any longer. But personality matters. It's okay to let it out at work. Be interesting. Be funny. Have interests. Uh, so those matter. When people with personality, I find they care more. So all of those are very important. Love that. Love it. It's, I shouldn't be saying it, right? Like personality is more important than smarts, but it is. Because if you're dry, you have drive and you have personality, I can do anything with you. I think it's well connected. It's, it's very close to attitude because the right attitude normally shows in the right personality and, and vice versa. Um, that's brilliant. So you, it sounds like really people caring, recognition. So all what we said so far is one of your success story, right? Now, let, let's see on the other on the other side of that. So what can be a challenge for someone like you that's been running an amazing and successful company, um, incredible, you said, hyper growth. So now it's all about expansion. So mm -hmm. what else potentially is missing for you? So what are the gaps that you see for yourself or organization to go to the next level, to achieve what could be a breakthrough? In other words, what are the challenges that you 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 think are important for you to make an impact? So there's a couple. One, it's the same thing that every single person I think would tell you in, in management is finding the right people, getting uh, those people who yeah. want to come into the office and are driven and motivated. Yes. I found that a lot of people think they're worth about twice what they actually are and throw in the, the, the cost of inflation. It's like, wait, wait, hold on. I need, I need more money. It's like, well, this is what the salary is and this is what it's worth, right? We're dictated by government rates. So finding the right people yes. and also 90 plus percent of our work is not remote. We are an in-person office. We don't work from home. Uh, there's a group that do, but for the most part, we don't. And the collaboration and communication and getting better happens when you're part of a team that works together and you have that loyalty to that team and that tribe. So we found a lot of people, it's, it's hard to bring in folks that don't want to come into the office. And some of them are very qualified, but it doesn't matter because if you're not part of the team, it's really hard. And so we try our best. We have some fantastic remote workers, but they're in the office once a month. They come up to the corporate office, where, wherever they live, but getting them as much as we can. And we almost never let junior folks work from home. It's only once you're really really experienced with it because of the learning, the learning curve for anybody that's more junior or even mid-level. So we pretty much limit it to more senior folks for work from home. Okay. And that's only in very certain circumstances. Okay. That's yeah. been one of the challenges. Uh, technology is always a challenge uh, or an opportunity, depending on how you look at it. The inclusion of AI and chat GPT and all of these, how do you do these to get, how do you leverage these technologies and concepts to be better than the others. I think I'm a little far behind in it. I know some of the other partner companies that we have are leveraging AI to help write proposals. We still do it the old fashioned way, writing it out and researching. Yeah. So that's an area for you to explore because it sounds like there is something potentially is missing that might be, look, I think my personal experience, we, with my line of work and also my clients on AI, for the time being, it's been primarily trying to optimize what they're already doing, reducing resources and 
and time of doing things that could be done by a machine in a good way. So at the moment, it's more about productivity rather than anything else. But it sounds like, it sounds like there is a way more than that for, for future, right? It's huge. And conveniently, the gentleman that I went after to run my growth division, uh, Jason, he's an expert in all of that stuff. Okay. And I'm mostly a Luddite. So he's trying to pull us into the world of modern technology uh, very quickly. And I think I go kicking and screaming half the time. And I don't understand what he's saying half the time. <laughs> but we have the guy that's forcing it and making sure that we're trying to stay up on it. Problem is, he's working with a bunch of old school folks, right? Like, I still don't have a functioning television, and I've never had cable on my own. So I'm still somewhere in the 1990s with part of my life, but trying to get to the cutting edge of where do we belong, and it's transforming in some areas what you can really do and the productivity increases that you can have. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, One question, going back to the first challenge about people, it sounds like, I mean, co- the COVID period has been definitely challenging for you. I mean, it's been challenging for everyone. But yeah. for, you know, for an organization that lead with people and people then in the ground working. So that's to me, I think I know already the answer. But more curious about, you said, only the senior people, they are, let's say, allowed to work remotely, but only in some specific conditions, situations. But don't you see prim- particularly the new generations asking for more flexibility than before. So you have to deal in a way or another with the request of people, especially again, in the younger generation of have more time working from home, commuting less, et cetera. Or that doesn't necessarily apply to your world because it's different. You know, look, every company is different. The service that provides normally are an indication for that. That's a big struggle. It is a big struggle. How how do you get the younger generation to merge up with the older generation and the work ethic? So we have found that we've gone through some younger people pretty quickly because we expect a certain level of behavior and you have to get the experience in order to get promoted, right? You don't just get to come in here, you spend six months and say, no, no, I should be the director and I I deserve $150,000 salary. Do you know how to get ahead? You work for it. And it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, all the books, what is it? 10,000 hours before you're an expert in something. 10,000 hours is five years of work, right? That's just at the core. 2,080 hours in a year. I mean, that's at least five years of work. But you're not an expert even then because it better be in one area. So to be able to get the experience and learn and collaborate, you have to be in person for me. Um, when you're more experienced, we still expect you in here because we need you training and teaching the younger ones. Yeah. So it's been a struggle trying to figure out the balance, but conveniently we have had, we bring them out of some of the universities all over the country to come in and to learn it. And if we get them early enough before they develop bad habits, it's not as problematic. Uh, we've never worked from home. Uh, after the second week of COVID, we were all hundred percent in the office and uh, the different, the generations, cause we're, we're, we're an older management team. Uh, if I say older, I'm in my 40s, right? So publicly, I'm in my 30s. Just be clear about that. But realistically, <laughs> let's be honest. But it, it is. It's a challenge. Like they know how to use a computer. I've never been on Twitter. I apparently called it the Facebook in a speech I gave once and I was laughed off the stage. But they have to come in and help me do it. Yeah. They're needed. I need them. They need me. Yeah. So we're trying to get to the right balance. And they need different things. Uh, I have a really great story. So I asked around, I'm like, what do you guys need from us? What are we not giving you that you think would really make a difference and entice people? And everybody under the age of 40 said to me, or 35 really said, we need a mental health day. We deserve mental health. Mm. I'm like, well, back in my day, we called mental health. You go home, you grab a bottle of wine and some ice cream and you call some friends, (laughs) right? That's, that's what we deal with it. Like, right. So I'm listening and I'm like, all right, let's do that. And I go and talk to some of the folks that were over the age of 35, the 45, the 55. It's like, mm. guys, how do you feel about a mental health day? Every single one of them said, heck no, I'm not taking that. There's nothing wrong with me. Mm. It's like, whoa, guys, it's really just another day of leave. It's like, no, I will not do anything that calls a mental health day. So instead I had to call it Maven appreciates you day, right? And so we gave everybody an additional day of leave. And the rules of it are, it's just for you. 
It's not used for a vacation. It's not used to go visit family or go to the dentist. We have plenty of days off for that. It's just a day for you. So the younger folks say, it's my mental health day. The older folks are, it's my play hooky day. I see. So there's a big generational just in the words that we're using. Yeah. And by changing the narrative and the language, you you allow essentially everyone to get what they wanted, although it's named and characterized in a different way. It's interesting, by the way, the what you shared about mental health. I mean, one of the major, I would say, bias that most of us have about the, the people that are working in your area, in your space, national security, they definitely suffer. I wouldn't say more than before. No, I don't have any data point to say that, but certainly mental health is something critical, important, given the, the, the level of pressure. It's not something mm -hmm. that your people on the front on the, on the front line, they recognize as is something, as something. Uh, they do recognize it. I, I do believe that there's been a big push to make sure there's understanding and awareness of PTSD. Yeah. And there's a number of folks with you know traumatic brain injuries. Yeah. There's emotional and medical, mental, whatever the issues are, uh, you have to be present, right? And you have to be there for the employee. And that's part of just listening and paying attention. So a couple things. One, we do pay attention. We know when somebody's struggling. And if you are struggling, it's the same. If I break my leg, I go to the doctor. Nobody's going to judge me for that. It's the same thing. If I'm struggling with something else in my head or whatever it is, I have to go get it fixed. I go to the doctor. There's no difference in that. And so a couple of things we do there. One, we do, we do pay attention. Two, we provide uh, something called the EAC, employment, employee, it's EAC. It's, it's a free service that will help you work right. through anything uh, okay. that we provide that it's part of our benefits package. And once a year, and an amazing friend of mine, Jean-Paul Delange, he runs a business that helps deal with trauma and PTSD and some options to deal with it mm. and what they are. So we hold an occasional lunch and learn where we invite everybody in the company to attend and we'll try to bring in a speaker. Nice. nice. Well, but you do, great. you have to pay attention. Like, right. I, I don't want to bring some of my problems to work, but when I have a problem, like my business partner is great at saying, at least you're starting to get a little tightly wound time for you to step away. Yeah. Right. And he's like, sometimes it's like, could you please go take a couple hours? You're starting to get a little annoying. I know you need a break. I, thank God I have him to do that for me. But sometimes it's a lot bigger than that. And you have to watch what can we do to help and pay attention. Yeah. And I don't know whether you have you have seen on, on social media, you said that you're not a big fan of social media, but, you know, a, a, an interesting advertising that has been created by, I think, rugby, I think it was rugby uh, club here in the UK, rugby or football, I don't remember, maybe football, but it doesn't matter. So essentially where, um, you know, it, 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 as an example of these ads, there are two fans, they're going to the stadium and one is complaining, 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 complaining. And the other person is just there listening, but it doesn't say much. And at some point, it's very, very hard, by the way. At some point, one of those, one of the two is not coming anymore at the stadium because something happened. But he's not the guy that was talkative. He was mm -hmm. the other guy. I think it's mm -hmm. a great advertising promotion to say when... The fact that people, they are not speaking up doesn't mean that everything is going well in their life. Yeah. And my experience, the only way to tackle mental health is providing a space and environment where people can really feel free to speak up and say what they really think, what they feel. And, you know, unless that's in place, we are going to miss as leaders, a lot of things happening, Absolutely. unfortunately. So it's a great sharing, Lisa. Okay, let me shift a little bit here in terms of you you as a CEO, you as a leader. I mean, you, you've gone through a number of <laughs> fascinating changes for yourself. And now you are a CEO of a, of a growing organization. What people don't know about you um, being a CEO? So, you know, there are a lot, of, um, a lot of things that we think applies to CEOs. You know, they feel lonely. Um, they need to spend time with the... With people they don't understand them uh but at the same time they don't have um always all the fact information or to make a decision these are kind of stereotypes most of them by the way are true by definition but must maybe are not so for you 
what people don't know about you as a CEO? I think I'd like people to know what, what people don't know is that we're really trying to do the right thing. Okay. We are really trying, we're, we're never out to get you. We're not trying to make your life more difficult. We're not trying to add more hours to your day by requiring training. We're not trying to change your medical plan to make it more painful on you. We're, we're, we're not trying to take or add this or that. We're doing the best we can with what we know. And I'm really good at a lot of things, but I'm not a mind reader and I can't fix something that isn't broken. But when I have as many facts as presented, I promise you, we're going to make the right decision for the people. And I believe in the old army concept of mission first people always. We have to take care of the group as a whole. And it's really not something we can control when insurance doesn't accept what you want them to accept. But somehow it's always the management's fault, which I'll take. But yeah. we're really trying to do the right thing. Call me, call anybody in the management team and let's work through it. Don't just complain about it and then walk away. Is we're here to support you, but we can't know everything. And you know what? Sometimes it's just not going to go in your favor. Yeah. And it's frustrating. It's it's hard. So I never feel like I'm making the right decision that'll please all the people because there's always somebody who's angry about it. Um, so when I put out the student loan reimbursement program, which I was so proud of because I want to entice people to come to us that want to focus on their education. I had a lot of folks that said, well, that's not fair. I've already paid off my student loan. What are you going to do for me? Mm. And I'm trying to come up with more ideas on what to do, but where is that? Where's the balance? So the struggle is constant and you want to put people over profits, but at what point does it end? How do you do the right thing all the time? But what happens if somebody has one problem, the next person has another, at what point can you run the business or take care of? So you have to take care of the holistic. And that's what we focus on. We spend a lot of time trying to do the right thing with as much facts as we have. We'll lose money on some perks. I'm okay with that. But I can't lose money every time. And I can't always side with the employee because I still have to keep the business afloat and support the vast majority of the mission and the people. And that's probably the most, most difficult thing in being the CEO is we're trying to do the right thing and still the hate mail comes in and, and whatnot. Um, what else do I want them to know? I'd like to have a life. I really would like to have a life. Please don't call me at 10 o'clock at night. Please don't send me crazy emails on LinkedIn at one in the morning because you've been drinking. Oh my goodness. Um, did you there set is. any it, did you set any rules for not having communications, emails, et cetera, outside of the working hours? Or is or it's difficult? My working hours are pretty broad, so <laughs> it's not as much of a problem. <laughs> but I do believe in the open door policy. But right, remember, right. I, I would like to. I actually like my significant other. I enjoy spending time with him yeah. and his kids. And I'd like to have a meal that goes by every now and then. And if I don't answer the phone for an hour, maybe I'm just having dinner with with someone. And the work-life balance, I don't think exists. It really doesn't. It's a work-life integration. Some things matter more one day and some things matter more another day. I'm with you. I don't believe at all to the work-life balance conversation. Completely useless. Doesn't exist. Useless. Yeah, I agree. I'm with you. Now, just one thing, going back to the point that you made before, by the way, I appreciate the the vulnerability you just actually uh, share with me. You know, this idea, look, you know, sometimes I can't please everyone and, you know, and it's hard for us to make decisions based on what we know. But look, as long as people understand that we are driven by a goodwill to support yeah. people, people, for me, it's enough to feel, it sounds like, to feel okay with yourself or, or that's the, the question or you're feeling look, behind the behind the scene, you still feel bad for having someone that is not happy with that decision. How does it yeah, make it feel? It's devastating. And I'm not going to lie, I've puked my guts out a few times mm. after having made a decision. It's like, I mean, you're a great person, but you don't belong here, right? Something as simple as that is, do you really feel like you're a fit for this mm. organization? It's people I've loved and respected that I've had to ask to leave sometimes, it's like, you're really fantastic. And I gotta t- I've gotta. i been sick to my stomach. I've puked my guts out. You choose it. It's happened. And we really struggle with doing the right thing. 
I talk about it with, I, I part of an executive women's group, which I started, I called six of the coolest women I've ever met that also are executives in your organizations. Totally worth talking to them all. And I talk about it with them like, hey, what have you guys done here? It, trying to get what's the best option and hearing other points of view. So we struggle with the right decision and it's never going to be right for a hundred percent of the people. And if it's wrong for somebody, I'm going to try to work around it, but it's not always going to happen. Yeah. But it just stinks sometimes straight up stinks. And three in the morning, I'm still typing notes on my phone. And I finally found the keep notes function on my phone. I was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. So at three in the morning, I'm like, oh, oh, I could do this. Let me try that. <laughs> so it keeps me up at night. It causes wrinkles. It causes anything. But yeah, it matters. The people do matter. By <laughs> the way, how do you sleep? So you sleep well at night? Um, I don't touch any caffeine and I haven't for 14 years. Okay. And wow. so, yes, uh, they give me a hard time because I've never had a cup of coffee. Okay. They wow. don't want to see me on it. Yeah. Um, you help for your for your stress level, for your sleep or no? <laughs> okay. no I, I usually sleep fairly well, but okay. I, I think sleep is the magical superpower. If I can go to sleep, it's happening. Right. If, there's nothing more powerful than a good night's sleep. And people are like, oh, it's cool to sleep only four hours. Like, no, it's cool to sleep seven hours. Yes. You wake up as a whole new person. Your brain functions better. Everything uh, functions better. Uh, I do worry. So I do wake up a lot at two in the morning. That could be because I'm not far from 50 and that just <laughs> goes with life. But uh, I do wake up thinking about things and stressing and, oh my gosh, I forgot something. And then I'm right on my phone or I go and find my computer in the middle of the night and I feel bad for my significant other. He's like, oh, look, there's another one in bed with us again. It's a computer again. So he gives me a hard time about it. But if at two in the morning, I can't get it off of my mind that I have to deal with this, it happens. So sleep is interrupted Yeah, uh, because of it. But the moment I can sleep, it's going to happen. I know. It's it's a game changer for people, by the way. so They don't get it. It's not cool to no, sleep four hours in the morning. It's cool to be refreshed and to feel ready to tackle the world. And the brain needs that. Whether we like it or not, brains need you know good seven or eight hours of sleep for regenerating their cells. So unfortunately, <laughs> that is physiologic. So that's amazing. Lisa, the, the last two, three questions, very quick for a quick answer. So a mm -hmm. couple of minutes maximum. So is there one thing among many things that you consider your most important learning in your whole life career? Is there one thing? Fail early, fail often. Surround yourself with really smart people, people smarter than you, and listen to them. Doesn't matter how smart they are if you don't listen to them. So that's yeah. That's perfect. That's a great advice. On the other hand, is there anything that you regret in your life? One thing that you would have done differently or nothing? I, All of our failures have resulted in getting to the right answer. Looking back, I would be, my guidance would be don't celebrate until the ink is dry. Okay. You need the ink to be signed for most contracts. Uh, <laughs> that's been a couple of rough moments. And Good surround way. yourself with the right people. And that's exactly what it is. And careful to hire, quick to fire. You have to know when the person is no longer right for your stage in your company or that stage in your life. And that's personal and professional, right? It's where I we screwed up in the past is we've kept somebody because we've liked them. We won't do that anymore. Everybody we have here is a high functioning belongs now. And that took a long time to get to because it's hard and it stinks yeah. to get rid of somebody that you really care about, but you're doing them a favor and you a favor when you say, Hey, let's find something else. So yeah, that's I my biggest that. regret is not giving people the opportunity to be their best self at another place. Wow. That's wonderful. Cause I can tell you most of CEOs I know, they always struggle to make this decision quicker and faster because they either, because they are believing too much on the possibility that people can change or because they are caring too much about people so that they don't have the courage to make hard decisions, tough decisions like the ones that you just shared. So it's hard. And that's one hard. of those times are two in the morning and yeah. Yeah. Especially it's if you are a leader that it's a people care leader, that's what's going to happen to you. You're going to face these challenges all the time. Agreed. So last question, you said that, you know, we said at the beginning that you 
always looking for something new to learn, et cetera. What's your best thing to learn? What is the best way, by the way, to learn? Is it by reading? Is it by something else? And if it's reading, is there any, any book that really made a difference in your life? It's multifaceted. I go back to yeah. surrounding yourself with the right people and listening to them, right? That's the number one. And I, the the groups that I work with and the, the individuals in my life, I've really called down my friend closet to be the right people that help me become better as a human being and as a leader. And for books, I actually give it to anybody in the company who wants it. And if I read something I like, I frequently will send it out to everybody to say, hey, who wants a copy of my book and join my little book club? And I don't actually make them tell me about the book, but I send it anyway. Is um, a woman named Dr. Carol Dweck wrote Mindset. Yep. It is the biggest game-changing book you could ever have, in my, my opinion. And it's you have an active mindset or you have a fixed mindset. If you don't have an active mindset, I, I don't want you around. You want a growth. I mean, growth mindset is, is the term she uses. Yes. But it's, yes, I can do this even if I've never done it before. Yes. Right. And, and she goes as far as to say you can learn anything to include being an athlete or being a singer. I can promise you not even in the shower am I going to be able to sing any note. But she says you can. And I love that. But. 15 years ago, I didn't think I'd, I'd have a company with almost 500 people in it. And I didn't think I'd be capable, but the growth mindset and listening to people makes all the difference. Yeah. So we hire people with the growth mindset, read Dr. Carol Dweck. It'll change views on parenting. It'll change views on professional growth, development, skills, everything. Fantastic author. Yeah. It's fantastic author, fantastic book. You know, 90 90- 5% of my work is on mindset shift. So for me, that is a reference book. And I think it's a good enough as a basic for people to start understanding the difference. Then of course there is more, but I think it's a great, great reference. So Lisa, that was amazing. So where people should go if they want to learn more about what you do, what Maven does and more, mm-hmm. you know, understand a bit more about you as a person. Yep. Uh, you're probably not going to find me on social media other than LinkedIn, but maven.com, M-A-Y-V-I-N.com. Well, yeah, well, we'll put this one in the show notes. Me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, Lisa, wonderful. I enjoyed so much this conversation. So thank you so much for being on the show today with me. Thank you for having me. This has been so much fun. It makes me think in different ways and that's what it's about. 